Now I am recording. Okay, so where we left off was here. So I said that even though the heart's moving five liters of blood, roughly, through itself every minute, that blood moves so quickly that the heart can't actually utilize that blood as a sense of oxygen and nutrients. It has its own what's called coronary circulation. Coming off of the aorta, which you will learn carries the oxygenated blood, you have two coronary arteries. And then those coronary arteries bring oxygenated blood to the heart's tissues. Coronary capillaries allow exchange of substances between the uh, uh, coronary circulation and the tissues of the heart and then the deoxygenated blood then leaves the heart through what's called cardiac veins and then it returns to what's called a coronary sinus and then eventually in back to um, the uh, the right atrium but the important thing I want you to know at this time is that the blood is that the heart has its own coronary circulation so here's the aorta here notice this artery right here and this artery right here these are the coronary arteries the coronary arteries bring oxygenated blood to the tissues of the heart that's the heart's actual blood supply by the way these are the arteries that when they become blocked lead to heart attacks or what's called a myocardial infarction you probably thought that the great vessels up here, like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the superior vena cava, that when they talk about blockages in the arteries of the heart, that these are what they're talking about. Certainly before I came a, became an AMP instructor, that's what I thought. It's not these. These are large. A little blockage in here really is not going to cause much much in the way of, of, of trouble with with flow of blood to the heart it's these blood small blood vessels here because that's what actually supplies the heart with its source of oxygen okay so these are the the coronary arteries are what can become clogged and if they become clogged you get a decrease in flow of blood to a portion of the heart whatever is whatever specific portion is fed by that artery. And that can lead to ischemia. Ischemia is a decrease in blood supply. Ischemia can then cause, because there's not enough oxygen reaching that portion of the heart, it can cause a, a buildup of lactic acid as that the, the uh, cardiac muscles are trying to produce ATP through anaerobic um, respiration. If it's severe enough, it's a, if it's a severe decrease in blood flow, then it can actually cause what's called a myocardial infarct or infarction. That is where you actually have uh, cardiac muscle cells dying, uh, and then that causes the myocardial infarction or blood supply. And I have a video I'm going to show you that's going to illustrate how that can occur. Now, at this point, don't worry about the details. This is just to illustrate the importance of the coronary circulation. Okay, what I want you to notice is here's the coronary uh, artery right here. Because the heart must continually beat, the coronary arteries serve a critical role, supplying the constantly active heart muscle with oxygenated blood. As we zoom in to observe the interior of this diseased coronary artery, notice the partially restricted blood flow due to the atherosclerotic plaque in the arterial wall. If part of this plaque ruptures, a thrombus forms and may grow and occlude the vessel. The thrombus detaches, causing an embolism, obstructing the blood flow through the artery. Since the supply of blood has been obstructed from reaching the region of the heart supplied by this artery, the myocardial cells become ischemic, resulting in damage to the heart muscle. Symptoms of a myocardial infarction may include shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, intense prolonged chest pain, nausea, fainting, and intense sweating, pain in the left shoulder, arm, jaw, and back. Because the heart, the heart must continually...
So here you have, um, just to sort of recap here. So here you have a coronary artery. This is an artery that's supplying blood to the heart's tissues for oxygen and uh, other, other nutrients. When we zoom in, you see there is this buildup of fat. That's called a atherosclerotic plaque. That can cause the development of a blood clot. What we, what we learned was a thrombus because you've got turbulent flow of blood. Uh, and this is going to further decrease the flow of blood through this artery, but uh, the patient may not even know, may, may not have any kind of real symptoms of this. But then one day that thrombus breaks off, becomes an embolus, and lodges in that artery. And then that completely shuts off blood flow to the specific part of the heart. And then what you see is that part of the heart becomes ischemic, decreased blood flow, and then it can actually, you can get a myocardial infarction where that part of the heart actually dies. And depending on where this occurs, this can actually cause the heart to fail and the person die. So from time to time, you hear about someone who like one minute they're fine and the next minute they fall over dead. Well, this is how it can happen. One moment, They've got a, a coronary artery that's partially blocked, but it's not causing any problems. There's a thrombus that's in that partially blocked artery, but again, it's not causing any kind of uh, symptoms or signs. And then it breaks off one day and uh, causes um, severe ischemia and a myocardial infarction, and the person just falls over dead. At this point, don't worry about learning, um, you know, the details of myocardial infarction. Do understand and know these terms, ischemia and infarct. We'll come back to um, how exactly this, uh, the details of how this can occur. But at this point, know that ischemia is a decrease in blood supply to tissues. And then an infarct is when there is uh, dead and deteriorating tissue as a result of ischemia. Okay, we're going to now move and talk about the physiology of the heart. So at this point, we've talked ma mainly about the anatomy of the heart. We're going to do the actual physiology. So we're going to look at the functions of the atria and the ventricles. We're going to define a pulmonary and a systemic circuit. We're going to describe the flow of blood through the heart, and we're going to explain the functions of the valves of the heart. So the heart is composed of four chambers, as you probably know. The upper chambers are referred to as the atria. The lower chambers are referred to as the ventricles. Please understand that the ventricles are really the pumps of the heart. The atria are just receiving chambers. They receive blood back from the body, and then they move that blood into the ventricles. The ventricles are the uh, chambers that actually end up producing pressure to move blood through the blood vessels. Also understand that the heart is really two pumps, and I emphasize this in the uh, anatomy of the heart lab presentation that I put together that you should uh, uh, either have looked at or should be looking at shortly. The heart's really two pumps. The right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood, that's blood that is low in oxygen, high in carbon dioxide, to the lungs. Well, why is it sent it to the lungs? Well, so it can get oxygenated. Oxygen is loaded, carbon dioxide is unloaded, and now oxygenated blood returns to the left atrium. This is the what's called the pulmonary circuit. Now that we have oxygenated blood in the left atrium. Oxygenated blood is blood that is high in oxygen, 
low in carbon dioxide, relatively. Now it's time for the heart to then pump that oxygenated blood to all of the different tissues of the body, right? And so blood then moves from the left atrium into the left ventricle, and the left ventricle pumps that blood via the aorta to all the different different systemic, what it's called, arteries. So it's it's going to your brain, it's going to your pinky toe, it's going to um, your fingers and all of the tissues in between. There, oxygen is loaded to the tissues, carbon dioxide is then removed from the tissues and loaded to the blood, and now we have oxygenated blood returning to the right ventricle, well, excuse me, to the right atrium and then to the right ventricle, and we're back where we started. So the heart is two pumps, one pumping blood through the pulmonary circuit to the lungs and back, and then the other pumping blood through the systemic circulation. Now, one of the things that I am emphasizing in lab, but also in lecture, is that you learn the flow of blood through the heart. You will have a question on your exam that tests your ability to, uh, un to, to, to know the flow of blood through the heart. You can't really appreciate or understand how the how the heart works if you can't describe the flow of blood through the heart. So make sure you're able to do that uh, prior to um, the exam. Now I'm going to demonstrate the flow of blood through the heart here. I also will demonstrate it on the presentation for, for lab because I emphasize um, using the anatomy to of the heart to describe the flow of blood through the heart, and thereby that helps you learn the anatomy, which is what you'll be responsible for doing um, in lab. So um, I like to start in the right atrium. You can start wherever you but I like the right atrium. So the right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava. Blood then leaves the right atrium, moves through the uh, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts and then moves blood into the pulmonary, tr pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary artery are the same thing. Yeah, the pulmonary arteries then take the blood to the lungs. Their oxygen is loaded into the blood. Carbon dioxide is removed from the blood. And then the oxygenated blood returns to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, blood moves through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. Left ventricle can then move blood through the aorta, and then that oxygenated blood is taken to all the systemic capillaries of the body, your pinky toe, your brain, your digestive tract, wherever. At those tissues, oxygen is unloaded to the tissues, carbon dioxide is loaded to the blood, and then deoxygenated blood returns to the right atrium via the inferior vena cava, and the superior vena cava. This may sound complicated right now, but I guarantee you if you sit down and you teach yourself the flow of blood through the heart, you'll understand this and it'll make perfectly good sense. Again, I also demonstrate this in the lab presentation because you'll want to use the same process in learning the flow of blood through the heart. You guys are very funny with the, with the emojis and stuff. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the heart valves. You've probably heard that the heart has valves, and indeed it does. And the function of valves is to make sure that blood moves in the same direction, at, in one direction. All right, we don't want m blood moving retrograde right? That will decrease the efficiency of the heart. So we always want, want blood moving from the atria to the ventricle. So to prevent the backflow of blood from ventricle to atrium, we have these atrioventricular valves. They're called atrioventricular valves because they're between the atria and the ventricles. However, no one calls, calls them the right and left atrioventricular valves. The right AV valve is always referred to as the tricuspid valve. The left AV valve is referred to as the bicuspid valve, or you can call it the mitral valve. I want you also to notice that these valves have little heart strings, which are called chordae tendinae, that are attached to muscles. And what happens is the when the ventricles contract, 
and these valves close to prevent them from uh, blowing back up into the atria, these muscles contract and, and, and using those chordae tendinae, they hold those valves tight so they don't blow back up into the atria. Without those chordae tendinae, these valves would blow back up into the atria, sort of like uh, if you've ever had um, an umbrella and you catch the wind with it and it turns inside out, that's how those valves might respond. And we don't want blood regurgitating back up into the atria um, after it's moved from the atria into the ventricles. That would decrease the efficiency of the heart and cause the heart to have to repump blood that it's already pumped. So those those AV valves close, those chordae tendinae hold them tightly. Chordae tendinae are are are, are literally heartstrings. So whenever whenever someone says oh, I'm pulling on your heartstrings, tell them not to do that because that would hurt. Those things actually exist. Now, when the ventricles contract, they send blood up these great vessels, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. As they're relaxing after they contract, blood would backflow back down into the ventricles. And we don't want that to happen either. So at the openings of each of these valves, we have other, I'm sorry, at the openings of these blood vessels, we have valves as well. They're called semilunar valves because uh, they're composed of these little leaflets that look like half moons, or at least someone thought they looked like half moons. And basically, they just make sure that blood that is ejected into these blood vessels by the ventricles doesn't backflow back down. They sort of remind me of like one-way doors where they they go one way, but they won't go the opposite way. They basically just catch the blood um, as it begins to move back toward the ventricles as the ventricles relax. Notice that they do not have chordae tendinae. Only the AV valves have the chordae tendinae. So this is what an AV valve looks like when it's open. You have blood flowing from the atria down into the ventricle. This is what it looks like when it's closed. The, um, when the atria relax and the ventricles contract to make sure we don't get backflow of blood up into the atria, these valves close. This prevents what's called regurgitation into the atria. With the ventricles contracting, they're now moving blood through the great vessels, the pulmonary trunk or artery, and the aorta. And those aortic semilunar valves are open. I should say the semilunar valves are open. Now with the ventricles relaxing and the great vessels being full of blood, that would cause the blood to move back down toward the ventricles and the, re and the ventricles would have to repump blood that they've already pumped. To prevent that, those semilunar valves come off the walls of those great vessels and they stop that. Right. Again, they act, they're a backstop. They act sort of like one way doors. That's why I like to think of them. Okay, let me pause for just a second and ask if there are any questions. Any questions about the role of the valves or the flow of blood through the heart? The heart is two pumps one pumping the right side, pumping blood through the pulmonary circuit, the left pumping blood through the systemic circuit. If there are no questions, we're going to move on to the next topic, which is the physiology of the heart. So we're going to compare and contrast the contractions of cardiocytes and skeletal muscles. We're also going to explain in detail the function of the intrinsic conduction system. We're going to explain the components of an EKG. Okay, let's come. Let's talk about. Um, let's compare and contrast skeletal muscle tissue and cardiac muscle tissue. And the reason why I want to do that is we've talked about skeletal muscle tissue already. 
And there are some similarities with costal tissue and there are some differences. So I want you to apply what you know to what you don't know perhaps. So the mechanism of contraction is the same. Notice they're both striated. Why are they both striated? Well, because their cells contain myofibrils. Those myofibrils contain the actin, the myosin filaments. They line up much the same way. They interact with the myosin head binding the actin filament, doing the power stroke, et cetera, et cetera. So that sliding filament mechanism of contraction is exactly the same. What is different is where the calcium comes from. In the skeletal muscle tissue, do you remember where the calcium came from that opens up those binding sites to the myosin filaments, myosin heads? Anyone? Anyone? The sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where the calcium comes from in skeletal muscles. In cardiac muscle cells, most of it comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but about 10 to 20% of it enters the cytoplasm through, ch through channels in the plasma membrane where it's coming from the extracellular fluid. What this means is that the calcium levels in the blood, since that's where the extracellular fluid comes from, can affect calcium in the extracellular fluid and therefore the beating of your cardiac muscle cells. In fact, uh, for people who have anxiety where their hearts tend to beat very hard, sometimes they're administered uh, medications that are calcium channel blockers that actually reduce the amount of calcium that enters those cardiac muscle cells. Another difference between cardiac muscle cells and Skeletal muscle cells is that cardiocytes, as they're called, are much more dependent on air respiration compared to skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells have a greater capacity to produce ATP through anaerobic respiration. Cardiac muscle cells are much more dependent on oxygen. In fact, they um, can your heart can beat continuously, whether you're awake or asleep, right, for all of your life. And as long as that heart is provided with oxygen and glucose, it never fatigues, right? It never fatigues. However, it doesn't have a lot of capacity to produce oxygen anaerobically. And that's why when you do have coronary arteries blocked, the you get quick death of those cardiac muscle cells. Also, those cardiac muscle cells have a lot of a protein called myoglobin in them. Myoglobin is very similar to hemoglobin in red blood cells. Myoglobin binds oxygen in the cytoplasm. Like hemoglobin, it's a, a protein. It also contains iron, and when oxygen binds to that myoglobin, it it emits a red color. So you'd see, if, you, if you've if you ever seen a, a heart, maybe some of you have hunted, hunt, and you've seen like the heart, the eaten heart, right? It has this very deep red color, right? Because of the presence of myoglobin. Another difference between the cardiac muscle cells is that they have intercalated discs. And I think you remember that from lab. They have intercalated discs between them. And those intercalated discs contain gap junctions. These are literally permeable junctions that allow sodium to pass from one cardiac muscle cell to the next. What that allows is for action potentials to be conducted from one cardiac muscle cell to the next. We did not see that in skeletal muscle cells. Every skeletal muscle cell is activated, or stimulated by a uh, motor neuron. It cannot be stimulated by adjacent skeletal muscle cells. But with cardiac muscle cells, action potentials generated in one can pass to the next, into the next, into the next. So that's another major difference. Oh, and one other thing I should mention is that some of these cardiac muscle cells, not most of them, but some of them 
can actually spontaneously generate action potentials. They have what's called pacemaker activity. They don't have to be stimulated by a motor neuron. Okay, let's talk about coordination of muscle contraction in the heart. So do we all agree that in order for the heart to function correctly, that the atria have to contract first, move the blood into the ventricles, and then the ventricles contract? Do we all agree with that? Anyone disagree, I should say? Second, do we all agree that the right and the left ventricles have to contract at the same time? Because remember, what's being moved from the right ventricle is heading eventually toward the left ventricle. So they've got to move that blood at the same time. So the atria have to contract before the ventricles, and the right and left ventricles have to contract at the same time in order for the heart to function normally, right? So this requires coordination of all those hundreds of thousands, or maybe it's even millions of cardiac muscle cells of the heart. They have to be, their contraction have to be coordinated. If they ran contract, the heart's not gonna be function properly, okay? So, this coordination of contraction is provided by a system called the intrinsic conduction system, or it's also referred to as the nodal system. It is responsible for the coordination of cardiac muscle cell contraction. It's responsible, responsible for the basic heart rhythm. It ensures that depolarization, that action potentials start in atria, and move down into the ventricles. That allows the atria to contract first and the ventricles to contract afterward. And also to make sure that the ventricles contract from apex to base. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a few cardiac muscle cells who have what's called pacemaker activity. They can spontaneously open their sodium channels causing action potentials and contraction. And they're gonna play a key role here in coordinated contraction of the heart, okay? Let's look at the components of the intrinsic conduction system. They are, I'm gonna list them out here and then I'm gonna show you these, um, uh, these components on a uh, on a figure, right? So let's, we're, gonna, we're gonna follow the pathway that potentials take through the heart, starting with the SA node or sinoatrial node. That's the actual pacemaker of the heart. That's the natural pacemaker of the heart. The second component of this system is the atrioventricular node. Then you have the atrioventricular bundle, the bundle branches, and then finally the Purkinje fibers. Now let's look at this in actual context. So this is an image from your book showing the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. Now remember we have the atria contracting first, then we have the ventricles contracting, and when the ventricles contract, they're moving blood from, from, sorry, from apex to base, driving that blood through the great vessels. So the sinoatrial node or SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. That is where depolarization starts. That's where action potentials are initiated. They then spread through the atria, causing the atria to contract. Those action potentials then pass through gap junctions between the cardiac muscle cells to the AV node, the atrioventricular node, here between the atrium and right ventricle. There, there's a pause before it moves on, and that allows the atria to empty of their blood. Then the action potential moves through the atrioventricular bundle, through what are called the bundle branches, and then finally into the Purkinje fibers and they move from apex to base. And as they move, the ventricles contract from apex 
to base, moving blood from the apex back toward the great vessels at the base, the pulmonary trunk and uh, aorta. This intrinsic conduction system ensures that the atria contract first, that the ventricles contract after that, and that the right and left ventricles contract at the same time. Now, one way we can monitor the movement of action potentials through the heart is with a EKG, which stands for electrocardiogram. The components of the EKG you are responsible for knowing, and so let's look at this. First, you have what's called a P wave. Then you have a QRS complex. And then you have a T wave. And this is literally mapping the movement of action potentials through the heart. The P wave is depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex is depolarization of the ventricles. And the T wave is repolarization of the ventricles. So did anyone notice that something's missing? What's missing? The repolarization of the atria. You don't see the repolarization of the atria because it's obscured by the QRS complex. So you see the P wave, which is the depolarization of the atria, QRS complex, depolarization of the ventricles, and T wave, which is the repolarization of the ventricles. Okay, let's um, look at this video here, this little animation that I stole off the internet, because what it does, it shows you uh, visually the movement of, uh, of um, action potentials through the heart, and then you can match it with the EKG here. So we're going to start at the depolarization of the atria coming up here. So here we have the P wave as the atria depolarize. Then here is the QRX complex coming up, QRS as the ventricles depolarize, and then we have repolarization of the ventricles here at the T wave. Okay, this is really slow, three beats per minute. We're gonna speed it up to 18 beats per minute. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. So you can see how the EKG basically graphically illustrates the movement of electrical activity through the heart. And this is uh, an amazing tool, a very useful tool for um, determining if the heart is working correctly and if not, why? Why might uh, um, it not be working correctly? Okay, we'll stop for a second and see if there are any questions before we move on. Michelle asked if I could type out um, the flow of blood through the heart and I can certainly uh, I can certainly do that. Um, it might actually even be in your book, but nevertheless I can certainly do that. In fact, I'll probably do that at the end of this presentation and it'll be uh, in the recording of this video as well. You're very welcome. Other questions. If there are any questions, what we're going to get into now, I believe, is uh, the fun part of the of the heart. Uh, I'm going to have some uh, nice videos for you to take a look at, um, or illustrations. I guess I shouldn't say they're, they're videos um, provided by the National Heart Association. This they used to be called National Heart Association. They may have changed the name, but we'll see that in a second. Okay, so now that you have an appreciation for how the heart works, Works and the importance of the intrinsic conduction system, uh, I want to define a few terms. We're going to define cardiac dysrhythmia, bradycardia, tachycardia, and less possible causes of each. 
We're going to define fibrillation. You're actually going to see a heart in fibrillation shortly. We're going to describe the events of the cardiac cycle, define systole and diastole, explain normal heart sounds, and define a heart murmur. And if we get through all that today, I will be just as happy as a lark. So cardiac dysrhythmia is any normal heart rhythm. We used to call this arrhythmias, and you'll still hear the term arrhythmia, but it's a bit of a misnomer. And if you're not sure what a misnomer is, it's, it's when you give something a name that is misleading, like a starfish. A starfish is not a fish, but we have fish in its name, so it's really misleading. And arrhythmia, A means no. So arrhythmia literally means no rhythm. Well, that's not what an arrhythmia is. It's an abnormal rhythm. So dysrhythmia is a better term for describing an abnormal rhythm of the heart. But arrhythmias, that term is still used um, today uh, in medical um, environments. Uh, and so you'll still hear that. But I prefer the term dysrhythmia. And basically, it's just abnormal beating of the heart. It can involve the atria, the ventricles, or both. And we're going to look at, look at those. So bradycardia is a heart rate that is below 60 beats per minute. Okay? And it's considered abnormal. However, I want to qualify normal and abnormal. What is normal really depends on a lot of things. It can depend on your age. It can depend on your physical conditioning. It depends on a lot of things. So if you have a heart rate that's below 60 beats per minute, I don't want you to freak out that something's wrong with your heart. Okay? The reference value we use is about 70 beats per minute as a normal heart rate. Okay? However, um, most of you, especially since most of you are young, are not going to have a heart rate that that's high, and you're fine. In 2014, when I was about 10 pounds lighter and I ran um, regularly, I had a heart rate that was 47 beats per minute. Okay. In fact, the nurse that I went to see uh, when I got a checkup had me scared because she was like, whoa, your heart rate's really low. The doctor comes in, check me out, said, okay, everything's cool. And I said, you're not concerned about my heart rate? And he's like, well, no, not given your age. And I said, do you run? I was like, well, yeah. I said, then I, I have no concerns. All right. So these, these values that I use, I don't want you to, for, for what's normal and what is quote unquote abnormal, I want you to understand that they depend on a lot of different factors. So don't freak out if, um, uh, the normal, if, if your heart rate doesn't fall, fall into the normal range, okay? But all things being equal, we consider 60 beats uh, a minute or, or heart rate below 60 beats per minute bradycardia, okay? And it can be due to several things. Typically, there is some damage in the heart that's preventing normal conduction of action potentials from the SA node to the AV node, what's called a heart block. And if one were to do an EKG, you may see a altered EKG. And I'm going to share these different blocks with you, but please understand that you are not, I repeat, not required to know them. This gives you some illustrations of what could cause bradycardia. Okay, all you need to know is bradycardia is, is abnormally low heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, okay? So this is the normal EKG shown here at the top. This first, uh, this second line of EKG uh, is uh, uh, what's called a first degree AV block. You have P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. Notice that there is a delay from, um, from the Q, R, S, Clex to the P complex. I'm sorry. Notice there's a delay from the P complex to the QRS complex. So that's going to result in a slightly lower heart rate. What if only one out of every two action potentials are conducted from 
the SA node to the AV node. You have P, Q, R, S, T, P, nothing. P, Q, S, T, P, nothing, right? So here you have every other beating of the um, atria, you have beating of the ventricles. Then in the third degree block, right, you have one for every three. Okay. Probably in these in these second these two here, you the um, individual is going to need a pace because they're not getting enough conduction from the SA node to the AV node to get uh, the the ventricles beating sufficiently. Okay. Again, you don't have to know these heart blocks. Whatever. I'm just illustrating what could possibly cause bradycardia. There could be other causes as well. Tachycardia is the opposite. Tachycardia is a heart rate above 100 per minute. And there are situations where tachycardia is normal. If you exercise, right, if you have a fever, if you're hyperventilating, if you have a sudden change in body position, this can temporarily increase your heart rate. However, outside of these circumstances, if you're just like sitting down, chilling, and your heart rate is above 100 beats per minute, and you're not anxious, right, then you have tachycardia. This can cause a myocardial infarction and lead to disease of the heart, which is called cardiomyopathy. If heart rate gets above 100 beats per minute, the heart, the ventricles may be contracting so quickly that they're not allowing for proper filling of themselves between beats. So in other words, um, blood is entering the ventricles when the ventricles are relaxed. If they are contracting so quickly, they're not allowing sufficient time for filling, and so they're not going to be ejecting sufficient amounts of blood to maintain blood pressure and distribute sufficient amounts of blood to the tissues of the body. So that's the uh, the danger with a heart that is tachycardic, especially as it uh, goes above 120 beats per minute. Also, this can lead to a situation which is called fibrillation, where the heart loses its normal coordinated beating. Okay? Fibrillation is uncoordinated contractions of the heart. This causes the shuddering of the heart. The heart takes on this sort of like bag of worms um, look to it as it contracts. And I'm going to show you some examples of that now. So let's take a moment here to move over to think this is it. Yes, American Heart Association. So, all right, everybody can see this. So what you're looking at here, you can see uh, um, an illustration of the heart beating normally. And you can see this normal EKG here. You see the atria contracting first, the ventricles are contracting second. You can actually even see the, the um, action potential moving from the atria to the ventricles. Okay. Now I want you to think of the proper beating of the heart as similar to um, the coordination that's required um, at a football stadium doing the wave, or the or a soccer stadium when you're doing the wave. If you've ever been like to Camp Randall, where the student section initiates the wave and it goes around, right? Everyone has to be coordinated in order for that wave to go through, right? You have to stand up and you have to sit down at the appropriate time for the wave to go all the way from the student section all the way around. And then when, when things are really happening, they go back, right? The same thing with the hundreds of thousands of cardiac muscle cells that are contracting. If they're not contracting in a precise, coordinated fashion, if they're just contracting randomly, then rather than getting this normal heartbeat, you get this. In the atria, we can get what's called atrial fibrillation. With atrial fibrillation, notice that we don't have that coordination, right? It's almost like the the cells of the atria are contracting um, randomly, right? So it looks like 
a partial bag of worms. Now, an atrial fibrillation is it is it, it, it does need medical attention, but it's not an emergency medical situation. Because of that uncoordinated beating, you can get turbulent flow of blood, which can cause blood clots, right? Which is a concern, but it's not like dial 911, we gotta get this person to the hospital. When we have ventricular fibrillation, however, right? The heart takes on this bag of worms look to it as there's loss of coordinated beating of those hundreds of thousands of cardiac muscle cells, right? And so effectively, the heart is no longer a pump. Look at the EKG. The heart is no longer an effective pump. It's not moving much in the way of blood. This is an emergency medical situation. Okay, so as I said, atrial fibrillation decreases the efficiency of the heart, also can increase the chances of blood clots. Um, so it, you do require medical attention, but it's not, not immediate. Ventricular uh, or v, uh, fibrillation or V-fib requires immediate attention. And if you uh, recall, you will see on the walls at uh, on campus actual defibrillators. These are units that will provide a shock to the heart it's almost like uh, pushing the reset button. That's why I think of it, where it basically shocks the heart. And hopefully after that, the um, SA node will take over. Now, some individuals, because of um, uh, previous medical conditions, maybe they've already had damage to their heart, are prone to fibrillation. They can actually have a what's called an internal cardioverter defibrillator implanted in them and it will detect uh, fibrillation and can deliver a shock and I'm going to play a video on that really quick and I think that will end our pretty much end our day but it's really cool no that's not it ah this is it An implantable defibrillator is a pacemaker-like device about the size of a pager. An implantable defibrillator is usually implanted under the skin in your upper chest. The battery and computer circuitry needed to correct your heart rhythm are contained in the device. Thin insulated wires called leads connect the implantable defibrillator to your heart. Typically, the implant procedure is done under local anesthesia. It does not require open heart surgery, and most people go home within 24 hours. An implantable defibrillator monitors your heart rhythm. If it detects a problem, it will use electrical pulses to correct your heart rate. Depending on how it's programmed, an implantable defibrillator can first use small, painless pulses to correct your heart. If these don't work, a stronger shock is delivered. A shock can be surprising and uncomfortable, sometimes even painful, but the feeling passes quickly. Okay, so for the, um, those patients who may be prone to fibrillation, they can have a implantable fibrillator placed in, and if it uh, it will monitor um, their uh, heart activity and will. Um, deliver a shock and, or, and defibrillate um, the heart, okay? So this is a normal EKG at the top. This is a fibrillation here at the bottom. Okay, um, so it is 1221, so I'm going to let you go. Um, all right, and um, for those of you who want to offer questions, please do so. Otherwise, uh, do remember that you have a quiz that is open and that will close tonight at midnight. Also, uh, I'll be emailing you a little um, learning activity that I want you to um, – um, I'll, I'll provide instructions. Uh, take a look at in, particip in uh, anticipation of our meeting on Friday. Okay, Michelle, you have a question.